Uh, last year, uh, the American Psychological Association published a report on the mental health of Generation Z with a specific focus on 18 to 21-year-olds. I don't know if you know anybody who's 18 to 21, but this is a report that they found. And they discovered that over 90%, 90% of 18 to 20 year olds report at least some significant mental health complaint during a month. And this includes feeling depressed or sad, lacking motivation or energy, feeling nervous, anxious, lying awake at night because of stress, eating too much or unhealthy food. And for the first time in the history of the United States, a minority, a minority of a generation report less than excellent or very good mental health. For example, Generation Z is now more likely to be diagnosed with depression or an anxiety disorder more than any other generation in America. Relatedly, the Center for Disease Studies found uh, that the rate of suicide from 2007 to 2017 has increased 76% for young people aged between 10 and 24, and is now suicide is the second leading cause of death in that generation. Back to the APA report, when asked about what is the source of all of this anxiety and depression, 81% of your generation report stress over money? Can you say amen? amen? Yeah. 77 report stress over work or school? Amen. <laughs> 75% report over stress about their health. 46% report stress over the economy. 33% report stress over personal debt. 39% report stress related to substance use or abuse, their own or that of a friend. And into that situation, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this from Matthew 6. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, about what you will eat or what you will drink, or about what you will wear, for is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap. They don't gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than them? And who among you, by worrying, can add a single hour to the span of your life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they don't toil or spin, and yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of those. And if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is here and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry about what we shall eat or what we shall drink or what we shall wear, for it is the Gentiles who strive after these things. And indeed, your Heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all of these things will be given to you. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow it will bring the worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. So how do you feel hearing that text given the stress you're under right now? I think we have like two options here. One is to just feel guilty. How many of you just, when you hear that text, just kind of feel slightly guilty? I have all this anxiety, I have all this stress, and then Jesus says, don't be, don't be worried. And if you are worried, it's an expression or a lack of faith. In fact, I've sat in situations in churches where I've had students told by pastors and preachers and good-hearted people that if you worry, it is a sin. Because Jesus said, do not worry, and you are disobeying his command. 
And yet, if the APA studies to believe 90% of us are sinning all the time, worrying a lot. And so I don't want us to hear this text as more shame and more guilt, just one more thing you're not doing very well this week. You got a lot on your plate. I think the other temptation here, too, is how hard it is. Even if you try to obey this text, is it, it's a little difficult, and I'm a psychologist, it's a little difficult to turn off your feelings. How many of you have been depressed and somebody looks at you and goes, cheer up, like, thank you. You genius, I forgot. I, I'm feeling a little down and I should just cheer up. Or if you're anxious, somebody says, quit worrying. You're like, thank you. I appreciate that. Quit worrying. I, I'd forgotten that was an option. So even if we want to stop worrying, it's not like we could just turn the faucet off. Our feelings kind of are out of control. They're a little bit unmanageable. And so we get stuck. So let me, let me just share this exhortation here. What Jesus is telling us here isn't just to stop worrying. He gives us something positive to do. At the very end, he says this. Seek first the kingdom. I think sometimes we think the, this job to stop worrying is something that I just got to do all on my own. It's just an act of willpower. If I just try hard enough, I can just somehow, through sheer force of will, stop worrying. And I don't know if you've noticed that, that's really hard to do. Jesus doesn't say that. He says, seek something else. The positive message here is seek the kingdom. And the kingdom isn't just you, by yourself, struggling all alone. That isn't the kingdom of God. You, by yourself, struggling, suffering, all alone. That's not the kingdom. The kingdom is the people of God caring for each other. The exhortation of the text here is to seek the people of God and let us carry each other's burdens. This is how Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this. Bonhoeffer writes this. He goes, help comes to us from the outside. Not just you digging deep and trying to find the resources to just turn the anxiety off or to cheer up. Help comes to us from the outside. God has willed that we seek and find God's living word in the testimony of other Christians. In the mouths of other human beings. Therefore, Christians need other Christians who speak God's word to them. We need each other again and again when we become uncertain or disheartened because living by our own resources, we cannot help ourselves without cheating ourselves out of the truth. And that is one of the saddest things that I see as a professor. When a student sits in front of me and I hear them talk and describe themselves, their worth, their value, their life, their prospects, their dreams, their futures, and they just see just gloom and doom and negativity. They cheat themselves out of the truth. And so we need other Christians as bearers and proclaimers of God's divine word of salvation. For the Christ in our own hearts is weaker than the Christ on the lips of other Christians. Did you hear that? The Christ in your heart is weaker and more uncertain than the Christ that comes to us on the lips of other Christians. Because when our own hearts are uncertain, the hearts of our brothers and sisters, they are sure. The exhortation is to seek each other. That when your heart becomes anxious and stressed and uncertain, that you seek grace and the truth in the lips of those who stand in front of you, your parents, your coaches, your teachers, your pastors, your professors, and your dear friends. Listen to the Christ that comes as they speak life back into you. 
But the other word here isn't just to seek the kingdom in each other. It's to, just to, it's to become the kingdom of God for each other. To stand there as a voice of grace and life. To speak into uncertain, anxious hearts. I've told this story before in chapel, but I want to end with this. I teach a Bible study, many of you know, out um, at the Maximum Security Prison north of Abilene. I'll be there tonight. And one night I was preaching about the love of God out there. And in the front row, Steve raised his hand. And Steve said, how can I believe in this love of God? Because nobody in my life had ever told me that they loved me. I never heard my father say he loved me. I never heard my mother say she loved me. I have never heard another human being say, I love you. And what kind of life would that have been like? And so Steve, because he had never heard another human being offer any tender words of affection, never heard on the lips of another person, I love you, he could not believe in this love of God. And so Steve needs me to be the kingdom. He needs me to go out there on Monday night and to hug him and to stand in front of him and for me to say to him week after week over and over again, Steve, I, I love you. And drop by drop, the love of God for Steve becomes more and more credible, more and more believable. Because when his heart is uncertain, my heart is sure. And so, brothers and sisters, that is my message for you. That you stand in front of each other, wherever that is. And you speak life back into each other over and over again. In Ezekiel, the prophet stands in a valley of dry bones. Nothing but deadness from horizon to horizon. And God says to the prophet, can these bones live again? And the prophet says, I don't know. And God says, prophesy over the bones that you shall live. May you be anointed with that prophetic calling. That as you look over the horizon of each other's lives and all you see is deadness, you just see anxiety, you just see a strain, you just see no hope on the future. It just doesn't seem like it's getting any better that you say to each other, there is life. The breath of God still breathes through you. You will live together. We will live and carry on. May you prophesy over each other in small ways and in large. Over coffee, conversation in a classroom, in a teacher's office, in a therapy room. Speak life. And when your hearts are uncertain and unsure, don't trust your uncertain heart. Listen to the Christ that comes to you in the words of those who love you. Let us pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may your spirit breathe through these, your people. May they become prophets who speak life back into each other again and again. And Father, when our hearts are uncertain, when we feel that we cannot carry the burden that is in front of us. May we hear your word on the lips of those who love us. Help us seek and become your kingdom people today and tomorrow and always. Father, bless our students as they travel. Keep them safe. Father, be with those who are on their winter mission. May they be the agents of grace on the streets of this nation. Father, be with these students who are visiting us today as they stand at a threshold and a crossroads that their anxious hearts are calm and peaceful that you have a plan for them in the season ahead. And be with their parents and their anxious hearts as they let them go.
And Father, may we hear the word that you spoke long ago on the cross, that you love us. May that calm and heal our broken, anxious hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.